Hello, everyone, uh, and welcome to this talk uh, on our seminar series. We are very happy today to be hosting Bo G from Virginia Tech. He will be talking to us about fair resource allocation and learning, uh, specifically combinatorial sleeping bandits with fairness constraints. Bo uh, received his bachelor's and master's degrees in information science and electronic engineering uh, from Zhejiang University in Hangzhou, China, uh, and his PhD in e ECE from the Ohio State University, Columbus, Ohio. Mm -hmm. He's an associate professor in the Department of Computer Science at Virgin Virginia Tech. Uh, prior to joining Virginia Tech, he was an associate professor um, uh, at Temple University, mm -hmm. and he was a senior member of the technical staff with AT&T Lab, AT Labs in San Ramon, California uh, from uh, 2013 to uh, 14. His research interests are in the modeling, analysis, control, optimization, and learning of computer and network systems, such as wired and wireless networks, large-scale IoT systems, high-performance computing systems, and data centers, and cyber physical systems, he's done wonderful work for our community in general, including recently chairing YOPT, where I was on the TP, mm -hmm. I was uh, one of the TPC co chairs, and I was completely um, amazed by how he was always available and returning to questions uh, within a minute. Um, so I'm amazed by his energy and his uh, mo motivated contributions overall. Um, so very happy to be having uh, hosting uh, Bo today. So let's uh, let Bo speak now. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, 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 Ali, uh, for the for the invitation and also the kind of introduction. It was my pleasure working with you on this Y opt. So uh, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Although it's still my morning time. Uh, so uh, it's it's really my great pleasure uh, to virtually meet all of you here. Uh, although I wish I could be visiting Turkey and also campus of Metu in person, uh, hopefully that can happen in the near future. So uh, today I'm going to talk about uh, fair resource allocation and learning, specifically computerial sleeping bandits with fairness constraints. So I will explain what it means in, in just a, a, a couple of minutes. So this is a joint work with my uh, PhD student, Feng Zhao Li at VT, and also my collaborator, Professor uh, Jia Liu at Ohio State University. So uh, ju just uh, before I talk about give my talk, let me try to give a very brief uh, overview of my own research uh, as Elif already in, uh, in introduced. My research interests uh, lie in the modeling, analysis, control, and optimization of computer and network systems. And the objective of my research is to investigate and understand a uh, fundamental question about those uh, complex network systems uh, using both uh, theoretical tools and the practical approaches, and hopefully to provide the use, useful insights uh, towards the design of systems and also algorithms that uh, are relevant in practice. So uh, specifically, I have been focused on these areas. Uh, I, I think my earlier work has been largely focused on wireless networks. Uh, over the past few years, I also uh, worked on wireless sensing, large-scale IoT systems, uh, programmable networks and the network virtualization, as well as data centers and the cloud computing. Uh, in, over the past few years, I also worked on data freshness and age of information. Okay, so I think nowadays it's it's hard to avoid talking about machine learning. So I have been trying to expand my research by making a connection between these two fields. So I view this connection uh, bidirectional. On the one hand, how how do we design? How do we exploit machine learning techniques? Uh, to design high-performance computer network systems. So this is going to be uh, the focus of today's talk. On the other hand, how do we uh, design computer network systems that better suit, uh, for example, larger scale distributed machine learning architecture and algorithms. So that's part of my ongoing work. Uh, all right, so this is just a brief uh, overview of my research. Uh, now let's talk about fair resource allocation and learning. Uh, I guess uh, all of us need to make a lot of decisions in our everyday life. Uh, apparently, whenever possible, we want to choose the best option we have. Uh, but in many cases, the challenge is that uh, we have to make decisions in the presence of uncertainty. Uh, in other words, basically, we, we have to make such decisions without knowing that which option is the best, okay? 
So uh, there are many such examples. Uh, in the following, let me share with you three specific examples uh, that arise in the application scenarios uh, that I have been looking at. So uh, the first application is about uh, wireless scheduling. Uh, so if you look at this figure, uh, there are multiple users that are competing uh, for the channels to transmit data to a common wireless access point. Uh, so when a packet is successfully transmitted, uh, the, the, the AP receives uh, uh, some sort of a reward, which for example, could represent the value of information contained in the packet. So this is a very simple uh, network setting. Uh, if you are familiar with wireless communication and uh, uh, networking, it's clear that there will be interference if multiple users are transmitting at the sim simultaneously. So the AP needs to choose uh, one user to transmit at the same time, at, at each time, okay? So apparently uh, it wants to choose the user that can bring the highest reward. However, the, the challenge here is that those rewards are unknown in advance, okay? So that's exactly the challenge we talked about. We have to make such decisions in the presence of such uh, uncertainty. Okay, so the second uh, example is about uh, uh, online advertising. Let's say, for example, you are browsing a website uh, like weather.com to check out the weather information in Ankara. Uh, so the website may display some ads to you. So if the ad is clicked by the user, uh, it can be viewed that the website receives a reward. So the website wants to choose to display an ad that has the highest click through rate so that it can maximize the number of clicks uh, and potentially the, the revenue. Uh, but again, here, the click-through rates are unknown. So uh, this again falls into the uh, scenario we talk about, how do you make such decisions in the presence of uncertainty? So the third example is about cloud sourcing. As a user, let's say we submit uh, a task to some online uh, cloud sourcing platform, for example, Amazon Mechanical Turk. Uh, then the platform will assign a worker to work on your task. Uh, when the task is completed, then the platform receives a payoff, which uh, uh, depends on the quality of the completed task, uh, which further depends on the skill level of the user. But again, the, the quality or the skill level here uh, is such information is not available in advance. So, so as you can see, all these three problems uh, and, uh, and uh, uh, many other problems of the same flavor uh, ask us to solve such a problem in the presence of uncertainty. So these problems can be formulated as uh, a classical problem called uh, multi-armed bandit, uh, for short called MAB. Okay, so in the next couple of minutes, I will try to briefly introduce the basic setting of MAB. Um, so for those who are familiar with MAB, uh, uh, please bear with me in the next couple of minutes. Uh, I just need to uh, set the ground, uh, lay the ground for the rest of my talk. So uh, in the basic MAB setting, there are uh, N actions you can take. So usually we call them arms. So I think that's related to some story about the casino. So if you walk into a casino, there could be, let's say N slot machines you can play. Uh, those slot machines together, are called a multi armed bandit, and the each slot machine is an arm. Okay, so uh, each arm uh, has an unknown reward distribution denoted by PI. And uh, if you, so at each time, each arm uh, will generate a reward, which is a random variable that follows this distribution PI. And we assume that the rewards of, of each arm is uh, ID over time. So at each time, you can choose one uh, arm to play and you will receive a reward uh, uh, contributed by, I mean, associated by, uh, with this arm, okay? So for example, in the first time slot, you choose uh, arm four and you get such a reward. Then you choose arm one and you get another reward. This proce procedure just continues. And your goal here is to maximize the uh, community reward, basically sum of all these rewards uh, over time, okay? So the question here is uh, which arm you want to choose in, in each round, okay? So imagine that you walk into this casino, right? So what would you do? Uh, I guess at the beginning, there's not much we can do, right? We, we have no idea about the, the main rewards of those arms. So probably we just play, we will have to play every arm at least once, okay? And after you play for some time, you will get uh, some samples of each arm and also an estimated mean 
mean reward of each arm. So at that point, what would you do? Uh, probably you would choose the arm that has the highest sample mean, right? I think that's a natural thing to do, which we call it uh, uh, exploitation, okay? So basically you stay with the best option you have found so far. But if you think about this, right? Uh, we may not have enough samples for, for each arm. So the estimated sample mean may be inaccurate either, okay? So we may have to try playing some other arms to make sure that we don't miss out on better options, okay? So that's called uh, exploitation, okay? Uh, this is a key trade-off uh, that appears in this MAB problem because you can only choose one arm to play, okay? So do you stay with the best option you have you have found so far or you want to uh, explore other options with the hope that you can uh, find the uh, find a better option okay so recall that our goal here is to maximize uh, reward but in MAB literature we usually look at a, a metric called the regret which is defined as the difference between the uh, optimal reward and the achieved reward so the optimal reward here is a constant basically you always play the best arm if you if you had that information in advance, right? So, so reward maximization is basically equivalent to regret minimization, okay? But with, uh, with this uh, regret metric, we are able to prove some interesting theoretical results, uh, which provide useful in insights for us. So this problem has been extensively start studied. Uh, in 1985, Lyon and Robbins uh, actually proved the fundamental law bound, uh, which is log T. So it basically says that the regret has to uh, increase at least as fast as log t, no matter which algorithm you use, okay? On the other hand, uh, there are several well-known algorithms people have proposed, which can achieve this lower bound. So they are called regret optimal in the asymptotic sense, okay? So I'm not going to talk about, uh, I'm not going to introduce all these algorithms, but I will, I will uh, talk about upper confidence bound or UCB because it's a key component of our proposed algorithm. So if you're interested in this bandier problem, there are three really good uh, books on this topic, okay? All right, so uh, next I will try to uh, introduce uh, how UCB works and why it can achieve the log T bound. Uh, first, some notations. So H here is the number of times you choose um, I up to time T. And uh, mu hat here is the sample mean of um, I when you have S samples. And the mu i is the true mean, okay? So uh, recall that uh, we may not have enough samples for each arm. So the estimated sample mean may not, I mean, the, the sample mean may be inaccurate, right? So what we are going to do here is to construct a confidence interval around this sample mean, okay? Such that with high probability, this true mean is contained in this confidence interval. Okay, and then we will look at the upper bound of this confidence interval and the choose an arm that has the highest uh, upper bound. That's why this algorithm is called upper confidence bound. Okay, and specifically the, the upper bound we choose here uh, is in this form. Alpha can be anything greater than two. Okay, so that's a UCB algorithm. Uh, it's a, uh, the first term is basically the sample mean and the second term is a bias we add to this uh, sample mean which is half of the confidence interval, okay? So this algorithm is very intuitive uh, because when the sample mean is high, this entire term, UCB index is high, we tend to choose this arm. So that corresponds to uh, exploitation we mentioned earlier. And on the other hand, uh, uh, the, the estimated sample mean may be inaccurate, right? We may not have enough samples. So when we haven't played this arm for a long time, this H in the denominator does not change but the numerator will keep increasing. So eventually this UCB in index term will, will keep increasing and you will tend to choose this arm. That corresponds to exploration, okay? So that's how UCB strikes the balance between exploitation and the ex exploration. So next I will explain why this UCB works and how we can achieve this log, t why it can achieve this log bound, okay? I will try to give you some uh, intuition. So first, the uh, trend of Hopkin inequality actually tells us that uh, the, the sample mean, the probability that the sample mean deviates from the uh, true mean by a small amount epsilon actually drops exponentially fa uh, fast when as the number of samples uh, increases, okay? So now if you plug in 
if you plug in this UCB term into this uh, inequality, you will see that this probability actually uh, decreases uh, drops uh, fast as T increases. So here, this term, uh, can you see my mouse? Uh, th this term, the, the second term here, uh, corresponds to epsilon, right? So if this H term, the number of times you choose this arm I, actually, uh, if, if it's at least log T, you can make this epsilon term very small. So the uh, sample me can be uh, very close to the, to the true mean. So the estimation tends to be accurate. Then the probability that you do not choose the best arm I star will also decrease uh, uh, very quickly with time T. So that's kind of the intuition behind that. Uh, I hope that uh, you can at least uh, understand why UCB works and the, why it can achieve this log T uh, regret uh, uh, at high level, all right? Uh, so it seems that uh, this problem can be uh, properly addressed. So what I have, have I done? So the motivation of my work is the following. Okay, so uh, in the classic MAB, in the classic MAB model, uh, we actually uh, do not consider several important factors. For example, the first, we assume that if you recall, we assume that only one arm can be selected, right? But in many applications, actually multiple arms can be selected in each round. And also we assume that all the arms are available for you to choose in every round, but that's not the case in some applications. Uh, some arms may, be, may not be available, we call it sleeping. And finally, uh, the MAB, the, the objective of the MAB problem is simply to maximize the re uh, reward. Okay, so without taking into account the fairness issue across the individual arms. But that's sometimes an important requirement for many applications. Okay, so I will go back to the applications I introduced and, to try, and try to explain why uh, these three factors are important. Okay, so first the wireless scheduling, we know that the, uh, the reward is unknown. Okay, and uh, if we use some multiplexing technologies, for example, OFDM, so multiple users can be selected to transmit simultaneously without causing interference, right? And also some users may not be available to transmit because uh, uh, they may experience poor channel conditions due to fading or, or mobility, okay? And uh, usually in such wireless networks, we have a, a certain quality of service requirement. For example, delivery ratio. So basically we want to ensure that a certain fraction of the packets must be delivered for each user. So that can be modeled as a fairness uh, uh, requirement, all right? Um, in the second example about online advertising, as you can see here, the clicks rates are unknown, okay? But here we can place more than one ad at the same time, right here, for example, five, okay? And some ads may not be irrelevant. For example, if you are browsing this website in Ankara, and if I display some products or services, that are specific about uh, US, you may not be interested, okay? So those may not be irrelevant. And the, some arms may have, some ads may have a pretty low click through rates, but you cannot simply just ignore them because usually there's a, a contract between the website and also the advertisers. So you have to ensure that each ad has to be, has to be displayed by a certain frequency according to the contract. So that can be modeled as fairness requirement as well. Uh, the third application about uh, uh, crowdsourcing. So sometimes a, a task can be divided into multiple subtasks. So multiple works will be assigned to work on those subtasks. Um, in some cases, uh, the, the work has to be physically uh, uh, available in some location during a certain period of time so that uh, the worker can work on the task. For example, those ride sharing services like uh, Uber or Lyft. Right. So you have to be around that area during that time window so that you can pick up the passenger. And the user may have some special requirement about the skills or the equipment. For example, what if the passenger requires requests a luxury car? So not all the, all the drivers are, are qualified to work on this task, okay? And the platform also wants to make the workers happy in the sense that they want to encourage more participation from the workers so that uh, it can help the platform grow in a sustained manner. So this can be for modeled as a fairness requirement as well, okay? So uh, I hope I have convinced you that all these three uh, factors are important. 
So because of that, we propose a unified model called uh, computorial sleeping MAB model with uh, fairness constraints that takes into account all these three factors. So this unified model also introduces new challenges. Uh, so besides the traditional trade-off between exploitation and exploration, we now have a new trade-off between reward maximization and the fairness guarantees, right? You, your goal is not simply to maximize the reward. You also want to ensure that the fairness requirement is satisfied. And because of this fairness uh, requirement, this constraint, the regret analysis becomes more challenging as well, all right? So uh, there has been, uh, um, so this is a list of really work on this topic, uh, but I don't have time to go through all of them. Uh, it's not an exhaustive list anyway. So the point here is that none of those existing work has considered a unified uh, MAB model as we considered. Uh, that takes into account all these three factors. So the question here is whether we can address all these three critical issues in this unified model. So in the rest of the talk, I will try to share with you uh, uh, some positive answers uh, uh, from our preliminary uh, results, okay? Uh, so first, the system model, uh, it, similar to the, the traditional MAB model, we have N arms. So XI of T is the uh, random reward uh, normalized between zero and one, and the mean reward is mu I, okay? Then at, at the beginning of each round, uh, a set of available arms is revealed to us. Uh, so it happens with a certain probability. And among the available arms, we want to choose a subset of them called S of T. And we require that the cardinality is less than or equal to M uh, due to resource constraints. For example, in the Wiley scheduling problem, uh, the number of channels, number of orthogonal channels is M, okay? So we call this S of T a super arm. It's basically a subset of arms. Once such an arm is selected, we can receive a, a reward, which is uh, basically a weighted sum of the rewards of, of each arm in this subset, okay? So it's, a, it's basically a linear function where WI is the constraint. Oh, sorry, it's the weight, okay? So next I will talk about the fairness requirement. So we use this D of T to denote the action vector. Basically, uh, this DI of T is equal to one if this arm is selected, otherwise it's equal to zero, okay? And we have this uh, so-called minimum selection fraction requirement or exposure requirement. So basically we require that uh, in the long run, the, each arm will be selected by at least RI fraction of time, okay? So that's the fairness requirement we we look at specifically in this problem, okay? So uh, let's try to formulate the problem of this reward maximization with fairness constraints. Uh, first, let's say, let's assume that everything is known. So it's a offline problem, okay? And we consider a special class of uh, stationary randomized policies. A stationary randomized policy basically makes uh, decisions uh, by according to a probability distribution. So you choose a, a super arm with a given uh, probability. So uh, each such policy is associated with a probability distribution Q. Okay. So, so this constraint basically corresponds to the, uh, the probability distribution, okay? And the objective function here is the uh, expected reward taking into account all these uh, probabilities. And this constraint is basically uh, the fairness requirement uh, for this stationary randomized policy. So I'm not going to dive deep into the, the mathematics here, uh, but here, that's the formulation. And if you look at this, it's actually a linear programming problem. Uh, everything is linear in Q, okay, the, the probability distribution. So this problem can be uh, efficiently solved in polynomial time, okay? So if you solve this problem and get the optimal solution Q star and the plug it into the objective function, you will get the optimal reward R star. Okay, so everything seems to be straightforward, but recall that uh, we have to solve this problem without knowing uh, the mean rewards mu in advance. Okay, so that's what we are going to look at. Uh, so we proposed this algorithm called uh, learning with fairness guarantees or for short called LFG. Uh, so there are two key components in this algorithm. I'll explain them one by one. Okay, first let's say if you don't worry about uh, fairness at all, uh, your goal is simply to maximize reward. So, so similar to the basic MAB problem, we know that several algorithms can achieve that goal, okay? Including UCB. So the UCB index here is like this. 
and we kept it as one because we normalize it between zero and one. Okay. So uh, what you do is basically to choose an arm that has the highest uh, uh, UCB index that can lead to a log T uh, upper bound of the regret. Okay. Uh, on the other hand, let's say if you don't care about reward maximization, you just want to ensure that the fairness is, is guaranteed. So this problem has been extensively studied in, in the network resource allocation literature using this uh, virtual queue technique. So basically we maintain a virtual queue for each arm, okay, where the uh, arrival rate uh, is, the fred, is the fairness requirement and the departure process is whether you choose this arm or not, okay? So if you can make all these queues stable, basically the queue length does not grow up to infinity, then the departure rate should be at least the arrival rate. That's exactly the, the fairness requirement we talk about, okay? So uh, we know that a max weight algorithm that uh, chooses a virtual queue that has the highest, uh, largest queue length will make all the queues stable, okay? So now we have seen that both of these problems, e each of them can be solved, but here we have to deal with both challenges, right? We, we have to strike the balance between reward maximization and the fairness guarantee. Uh, so a natural thing to do is to combine these two ideas. And that's what we did. So we tried to integrate UCB with this uh, virtual queue. So in each time slot, we tried to choose a subset of arms that has the largest the sum of these two terms, the virtual queue length and also the, uh, re the, the reward. And we use this uh, parameter eta to tune the weight or the priority of reward and maximization. Okay, so that, that's, our, our, that's our algorithm. To analyze the performance of, uh, of this algorithm, we consider two metrics. The first one is basically the, the fairness requirement. So, uh, or the feasibility optimality. So a policy, uh, if a policy satisfies the fairness requirement, we call it a feasible, okay? And uh, we want to look at a set of all such feasible vectors R, okay? And uh, this region that contains all such feasible vectors is called maximal feasibility region. And a policy, if a policy can spot any such vector strictly inside this region, we say it's feasibility optimal, all right? Uh, the second metric is about regret, okay? So that's a typical metric we look at for the online learning problem. So it's a difference between the optimal reward and the achieve the reward, okay? So there are two main results. In the first result, we basically show that uh, our algorithm can actually stabilize all the queues. Okay, so that indicates that the fairness requirement is satisfied. So we call it feasibility optimal. Okay, in the second result, uh, we actually uh, derive an upper bound on the regret. So there are two terms in the regret upper bound. Uh, the first one uh, is square root of log t over t, which is a typical learning and exploration cost. And the second term uh, captures the impact of the fairness constraints. Okay, so as you can see, if you have a larger eater, the bound is, is smaller. So you have a smaller regret, but is it always better to choose a larger eater? So if you look, if you recall the algorithm, right? The, we choose such a sub, sub, subset of arms in this manner. So when you have a larger eater, basically you, you pay more attention to the reward maximization. So it's possible that it takes longer to actually satisfy the fairness requirement. And that's indeed an important observation we make in the simulation results. So next, let me just quickly talk about the simulation results. Uh, we plot uh, regret versus time here. Uh, so, so we simulate our LFG algorithm with different values of eta uh, versus a baseline called LLRS, which is uh, adapted for a uh, combinatorial sleeping bandit problem without considering fairness constraints, okay? So as you can see, actually LLRS performs the best, it can achieve negative, uh, negative regret, which means that it's even better than optimal. But how, how that can happen, right? The catch is actually here. If you look at the right-hand side, you will see that this LLRS does not satisfy the fairness requirement. So without respecting the fairness requirement, it tends to choose the arms that have a higher reward. That's why it can do better than optimal, okay? If you go back to the left-hand side, you will see that all those uh, LFG algorithms will converge to a point that satisfies the uh, fairness requirement. And when ITER becomes larger, the regret becomes better, okay? But there's no free lunch. Uh, if we try to plot the selection fraction versus time, as you can see that, uh, let's just consider M1, for example. As you can see that when ITER is small, it converges very fast. 
but when it becomes larger, it can it converges much much slower. Okay, so there's a trade-off between the uh, achieved re regret and the time of convergence to a point that satisfies the fairness uh, requirement. Uh, we also plot uh, regret versus time horizon t in the logarithmic sc scale. So there are two types of uh, regret bounds. One is called the problem independent, where the constant in the big O notation does not depend on the problem parameters like me means mean reward. And the problem dependent bound, uh, in, in this problem dependent bound, the constant could depend on the parameters, okay, the, the problem par parameters. So this green curve corresponds to the problem independent bound and this uh, uh, red curve corresponds to the problem dependent bound. And in the upper bound we derived, it actually corresponds to the problem independent bound. But if we plot this regret, this blue curve, as you can see, it's closer to the problem dependent bound. I think that means our algorithm works pretty well, but our analysis needs to be refined so that we can show such a problem dependent bound, which is tighter, all right? So uh, since uh, we already used about 30 minutes, uh, uh, let me try to conclude what we have done. Okay, so we propose this uh, unified MAB framework that takes into account all these three factors we think are important in many applications. And we propose this uh, algorithm called learning with fairness guarantee, which can successfully address these two challenges. So we show uh, feasibility optimality and also derive a regret upper bound. Okay. So I think our work raises several interesting questions. Uh, some immediate ones uh, as follows. First, uh, we have seen that the bound we derived is not uh, tight, right? So can we uh, prove uh, a tight problem dependent bound? Uh, there's already some follow-up work around that direction. And also how do we choose a suitable value of eta, which could possibly be a function of t, okay? And I think more interesting problems are to consider uh, those more general models. For example, here we just consider simple linear function. What if we consider nonlinear reward functions like submodular functions? Also, what, what if we consider more sophisticated computorial structures like matroid rather than just the cardinality constraint we, we considered. Or there, there are many different fairness criteria people consider in the literature rather, besides the uh, temporal fairness we consider here. And in general, uh, the constrained version of the bandit learning problem is very interesting. Uh, finally, I think there are several other bandit models we can consider, for example, linear bandits and the kernelized bandits. So in the basic, MAB model, uh, all the arms are independent, uh, but these this general models can actually capture the uh, correlation among the arms, which are the case in many applications again, okay? Uh, finally, I think uh, in general, this algorithmic fairness is an important issue in the learning problems. So uh, that's a problem I'm very interested in, which I'm working on right now, okay? So that's pretty much what I would like to share. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I probably spoke too fast uh, because of this time constraint, but I, I, I'll be happy to take any questions you have. Thank you. Thank you, Bo. <clears throat> I, th I think uh, you spoke uh, just right. Uh, okay, in terms thank of, you. Uh, speed. And this was one of the most advanced talks on um, bandits that I've ever heard, I think. Uh, oh, thank you. Very, very illuminating to me. Uh, I have a few questions, but uh, sure. are there any questions from the audience first? Uh, thank, thank you very much, Bo. It was a, a great presentation. Uh, I oh, really enjoyed you. it. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I have a few questions. Uh, first of all, the, this is a very good work, especially I'm interested in about the uh, the sleeping arms. So, mm -hmm. uh, so uh, how is the fairness requirement paired with the sleeping arms? Uh, do we have do you have any distributional assumptions on the uh, sleep pattern? And oh, yeah. how does it affect the uh, fairness guarantees? Yeah, so we, we do, let me go back to the uh, model. So we do assume that uh, a, a, set, a subset of arms uh, uh, is available or sleeping with a certain probability. Okay, so uh, it, it will impact the uh, actual regret analysis. It will appear in that uh, constant terms, but it does not impact the uh, the the order, for example, this log t or square root of log t over t, okay. 
So it does make a, uh, it does impact the algorithm. I mean, in terms of algorithm design, it doesn't make any difference because we assume that a set of available arms is revealed to us at the beginning of each round. So among them, we choose a subset of arms we want to play. So that does not uh, impact our algorithm, but it does impact the analysis and also the regret upper bound. Uh, but but it's only a difference in the constant. I see. So if an yeah. arm, for instance, has a very small probability of being available, then uh, does it have a, a larger fairness regret? Yes. Yeah, so uh, if that's the case, I mean, first of all, uh, we need to look at the fairness requirement, right? whether it's feasible or not. So what we consider is this maximal feasibility region. Basically, it's a set of all feasible fairness requirements. As long as it's feasible, we can we can satisfy our algorithm can satisfy that, and uh, our regret upper bound still holds. Uh, I mean, if if it's it's not feasible, then there's not much we can do uh, in this. Or we haven't look, really looked into that case. Okay, I see that point. Uh, Thank you very much. Oh sure. Thank you. Thank you for your questions. Any other questions? Any other questions? <clears throat> um, I have a question about uh, fairness related to learning. Mm -hmm. um, so you, I think you mean distributed learning perhaps. I'm not sure. I mean, uh, constructing, uh, I'm, so let me rephrase my question. Mm -hmm. Sure. If we were to apply uh, these ideas to federated learning, um, where there's a bunch of nodes that are um, cooperating on mm -hmm. learning, um, what do you think we could model as a bandit there? I mean, do you, do you already have a model in mind that maps your work to that setting? Yeah, sure. That's a great question. Actually, we have thought about this problem. It's also related to the uh, future work we I, I briefly talk about. So here, mm -hmm. right? So so we actually consider this federated the, the worker selection problem in this federated uh, learning setting. So um, we we check some literature. It seems that the learning accuracy could be a submodular function of the selected uh, workers. So we try to formulate it as a, as a nonlinear reward function, so we, which is submodular. And we don't know, for example, we assume that the, again, the, the reward is unknown. So how do we address this problem? Uh, then we realized that actually uh, without learning, this problem is, hasn't been studied yet. Like assuming that the, the mean rewards are known, how do we maximize the reward subject to the fairness constraints in this case? hasn't been studied. So we look at this problem and the one paper was just published at uh, uh, IEEE MESS this year. Uh, so for the learning setting, I think, um, I feel it's an interesting problem. Uh, and I have some actually doubt about the metrics people used in the literature. For example, uh, in this problem, we assume linear function. So the, uh, the offline version can be solved optimally. You get it using this LP, right? So, so the definition of the regret is basically a difference between that optimal and your achieved uh, reward. But if the objective function is a submodular function, we know even the offline problem is MP complete. So we can now solve it in an optimal manner. So what some people consider in the literature is that it's the difference of one minus one over E times optimal and the achieved reward. Uh, reward. Okay, so because uh, they argument is that uh, one minus one over E is the best approximation ratio you can achieve for the submodule optimization problem. But to me, that uh, definition may, may not be the best one because uh, even though you, you can still uh, look at this definition and it shows uh, some sublinear regret, uh, in practice, actually, your performance will be much better than this, this uh, uh, one minus one over E times optimal because we know that usually those greedy algorithms work very well. Okay, so if you just do simulations and plot those uh, regrets, in most cases they will be they will be negative. So to me, it doesn't make much sense to to consider that metric. Uh, so I'm I'm still thinking about this problem and see what would be the 
most reasonable uh, regret definition we should look at in such cases. I yeah, I, I'm not sure if that answered your question. <laughs> no, it did. It did. I think. I mean, what I uh, what I got out of it is we would have to look at uh, some modular reward uh, in mm. learning problems. That that's what you've um, basically determined. Yeah. Um, and then uh, sub modular regret how it has to be. It's it's, it's still an open problem. Yeah, I, I think in the literature people do consider this definition basically the approximation ratio times the optimal uh -huh. minus right. the achieved right. uh, reward. But mm -hmm. uh, I myself am not fully convinced that this is a good metric to look at because you can still prove all these results, but uh, how practically relevant are those results uh, is a question to me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Okay, mm -hmm. nice. Mm -hmm then we will be looking forward to your future work. Oh, thank you. Yeah, as I mentioned, we also look at these linear bandits and the canonized bandits with constraints. So the, the paper is still uh, under review, uh, which I'm not able to talk about here. But if you're interested later, I will share that with you uh, if, uh, uh, when they become available. Nice. I mean, one thing that perhaps mm -hmm. I'm just thinking out loud here mm -hmm. is the, uh, these bandit problems under delay, under network delay, uh, observation delay. Uh, oh, you mean outdated, delay the outdated. feedback? Huh? Yeah, that yeah delay feedback. Delay feedback. Right, outdated uh, feedback, for example. Yeah, so uh, there's a, I think there are some papers that have been looking at this problem. Mm -hmm. uh, the MAB with delayed feedback and also all those variants of the problems with uh, delayed feedback. Uh, uh, I, I can share the papers with you if you are interested. Uh, I can share some links with you, yeah. Because in the federated learning case, that's another issue. That's true, that's true, yeah. Um, I, I think especially when we look at these networking problems, uh, usually, right, we have these delays uh, involved. So it's more natural to, to consider such a set, yeah. Well, are there any other questions to both? 